Good morning, man. And Lord, we, well, we missed our time last week, but you know, it was Thanksgiving, but Lord, we thank you for bringing us back together. I thank you for everybody on this call, everybody that's going to be on this call. Thank you for this time. But we start on Thursday in your word. God, I pray your word would penetrate, that it would quicken our spirit, that we will literally internalize the word. The word would become life. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Samantha. Now, I want to talk to you today from Galatians, the third chapter. And uh, you know, just turn open that up, third chapter, because um, I want to talk to you about grace, specifically about how uh, it's too good. It's too good to be true. That's what I want to talk about today. But, you know, if there's been one reoccurring thing throughout this entire teaching and emphasis on mindset, it's about the primacy of truth. It really does come down to truth being the critical element to a faith mindset. I mean, if you don't start with the truth, you can never get to faith. I really believe the flaw in a lot of faith teachings is that there is not the emphasis on truth. Because anytime you perceive a reality that is not truth, you're prone to act in a way that's inappropriate, unnecessary, and misguided. It's when you see things accurately, that's when you can do things properly. It's like the power of truth the power of truth. I mean, it's what gives you the right approach, the right perspective. It's like the real representation of what is out there has to be seen before there's even opportunity for you to have faith. God ultimately is a reality. Actually, he is the reality. And you don't have to speculate why you missed the mark or why you come up short. You, you don't have to like wonder why you lose or why things end up in the wrong way. It starts and ends with one thing, whether or not you are operating in truth. Anytime you're operating in a false reality and you're seeing things that are not there or you're reacting to things that are not real, anytime you're assuming things that are not in place, you cannot ever expect to be effective or to be uh, efficient or even to accomplish anything. It starts right there with the primacy of truth. That's why the battle is always the battle is always with you being aligned with what is true. To what degree are you on point? Are you self-aware or conscious of what is significant, what is important, what is pertinent, what is relevant? I mean, how, how much are you in touch with reality? How are you seeing things and whether you are precise or exact in your grasp of truth? Truth must be Truth must be the content of what you think. Truth is 
the basis of faith. Faith is not possible when truth is not the foundation. And so, if you're thinking, if you're thinking correctly, then you can function properly. You know, your mental health is synonymous with your mind being right. And so funny that demoniac, he was delivered when Luke said he was clothed and in his right mind. So when you apply truth with precision, you cannot help but gain the advantage or to have mastery. You, you can't help but have clarity. It all starts right there. And um, I want to talk to you because you know, Galatia is a church that uh, Paul was very, very concerned about. I mean, Galatians is a book where Paul seems to have an edge. The Apostle Paul is um, he's agitated. He's uh, he's miffed. He's a little upset. He doesn't talk to the Galatians in a um, a kind, um, nice way. Galatians is the closest thing to seeing Paul when he may be even mad, frustrated. He's upset. And uh, the reason is because they have gotten off track. These believers have been, uh, a, they've, they've consumed some falsehood. They've, they've believed some lies. They've taken in something that has uh, caused them to have spiritual indigestion. And they're wavering. They are hemorrhaging. They're, they are struggling. And uh, he clearly is um, concerned about them. I mean, he even says, I ain't sure about y'all. He says, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm not certain that y'all are going to be okay. I mean, you, you don't get this from any other of his epistles, okay? Now, there was a letter that he sent to the Corinth, to the church at Corinth, but it was a lost letter. It's really the second Corinthians, but we never saw that. You know, when you see first and second Corinthians, it's actually, it was three letters he wrote. But the second letter got lost, so we don't know. But we know that it was a letter because we read what happened in second Corinthians, and it must have been a it must have been a hot letter. <laughs> it, it must have been a blazing hot letter because you know, he talks about it in 2 Corinthians and that he was sorry he had to come with them with a rod. But um, I'd be interested to, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord if I can read that letter. I want to see what it says. <laughs> Not right now, Lord. I ain't ready to go to heaven yet. I'm just saying. <laughs> But it's just so interesting because his passion comes up because he realizes that they have they have believed something that has thrown them off, that has um, put them out of sorts, and um, you know they were progressing so well. He says here in. Um, Chapter three, he says, oh, foolish Galatians. Um, one, one translation says, senseless Galatians. That's what Bartlett said. Irrational Galatians. I mean, what, what in the world? 
Um, Knox even says it even more. He says, you stupid Galatians. I mean, that's the tenor of how. What in the world? Who have bewitched you? I love the fact that Paul associates lies, falsehood, um, misinformation with witchcraft, with demonic behavior. Listen, the devil is a liar, okay? He is the father of lies. Whenever there is demonic activity, there is the deviation from truth. You always know when somebody is of the foreign spirit of the devil because they are operating in something that is not according to truth. He said, who have bewitched you? Who has, has deceived you? Who has led you to believe something that is absolutely not true? Who has distracted you with something that has taken you off of what you were taught, what you have come to know, what you have experienced? In he says, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And I want to emphasize the word obey. I mean, who, who, who done put a spell on you where you have refused to remain loyal to the truth that you have somehow or another been led to believe what you had come to know is no longer appropriate and no longer real. That's crazy. He says, um, who's before eyes, before whose eyes Jesus Christ have been evidently set forth and crucified among you. I mean, how in the world could you let somebody talk you out of what you had received and what you had gotten from God? Come on, man. You know God saved you. He delivered you. How can somebody come along and tell you something and then you leave that or you somehow not believe something when you have experienced See, see, your experience in the Lord should solidify what you know about the Lord. Because many things God revealed to you, he, he substantiated by your experience. I mean, the more and longer you're in God, the more entrenched you are in the truth. Because initially, it was a teaching. But when it became an experience, it became your narrative. It became something that you don't just know from knowledge. You know from experience. See, I, somebody called you talking about some God ain't good. You say, well, you crazy, man. Well, where in the scripture does it say? I ain't got to go to no scripture. I know God has been good to me by my own personal experience. I can tell you for a if it had not been for the Lord, it was on my side. <laughs> That's what he's saying to these Galatians. What is this I'm hearing about y'all? He says, uh, this is what I learned of you. Or, or this is what I want to ask you. I'm just wondering about this about y'all. He say, he say, receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. In other words, I mean, did you did you get the spirit by effort, by work? I mean, did you get what you had because you put a lot of work in? You did it all the perfect things. You did everything right, or was it just a simple receiving by virtue of receiving the truth? Was this something that happened to you or is it something that you may happen for yourself? 
and he's being sarcastic because you know good and well you ain't you ain't do this on your own and you didn't make this happen. You're not saved because you got everything together. People say they pull themselves up by the bootstrap. How do you do that anyway? Have you ever seen anybody do that? I'm wondering how can you pull yourself up if you're standing and you got your, how can you pull yourself up? Your own weight will keep you down. I never understood that, but I mean, really, what he's saying is, is, is how can you assume a posture where you got it by grace, but now you're going to do it by works? I, I mean, how, how irrational is it? Because even in your own experience, you know good and well, you're not where you are because you are perfect. You're not where you are because you are precise and you did everything right. you where you are by grace. My own thing you did was listen. <laughs> you heard, okay? <laughs> it was just something that came to you. You didn't pull it down. You didn't make it happen. He says, are ye so foolish? I mean, senseless. I want to uh, Philip, Phil, uh, Philip Chansley, I like Philip Chansley. He said, How can you be so idiotic <laughs> as to think, having begun in the spirit, ye are now made perfect by the flesh? Let me say, Philip said, he said, to think that a man begins his spiritual life in the spirit and then completes it by reverting to outward observances. I mean, how in the world can you start off in the spirit and just be doing so well and then you drop the good start and you go back to something that didn't work before. To something that never is, there was a failure before. It's like you got delivered from something and then you went back to it. So how crazy is that? Have you suffered so many things in vain if it, if it be yet in vain? Like I said, Paul ain't dropped. He, he is coming hard and he's coming strong because he wants to sound the alarm to them that this must stop. This cannot be the truth that you operate in. You cannot allow yourself to get caught up in a truth that will hinder, inhibit, block, that will cause you to revert and lose what you have gained. I mean, what a waste for you to be this blessed and then you to turn back and go back into bondage. He says, well, he that ministers to you the spirit and work of miracles among you, doeth it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Once again, that hearing of faith. What does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by a word from God. Notice that faith comes. Faith ain't got nothing to do with your effort. Faith isn't something, your discipline. Uh, I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe. But you don't get faith by, you know, straining and struggling within yourself. You know how you get faith? You get faith by hearing the truth. God makes sure you have faith because he speaks truth. And when he speaks truth, you receive and believe that truth. And at that point, you have faith. It's all God. You ain't got nothing to do with it. You can't have faith without truth. You can't have truth without God speaking. It's really, really simple. It really is easy. And so it's funny how... And I want to talk about this because it's funny how, you know, you can have a sincere desire to do the right thing and you can be so off base. 
and, and it's funny because the enemy tricks you because it's like you can really be trying to do the right thing but go about it the wrong way because you operate in a false truth. It's like it's like the best thing about being saved is the fact that you're free. Yeah. I mean, the relief of not having to labor under stress and pressure and to come into a reality where you're at ease and you have peace. I mean, it's like salvation affords you the opportunity to not worry about nothing. And I mean, to just be at peace. To just uh, feel secure. And to not have no, no inner turmoil. I mean, that's the great thing. I, I hesitate when I was say the greatest thing, but for me, the greatest thing about the Lord is how good I can feel. <laughs> Having the Lord makes me have a feeling of relief, peace. You know, I know sometimes people try to get people to get saved because they don't want them to go to hell, but ain't nobody. I mean, <laughs> the best motivation is just how good you can live. How great you can be. I mean, who, who, I'm gonna tell you, if sinners knew how good it can, how it feels, because sinners are about feeling good. That's why they drink and get high. And <laughs> remember, remember when you was a sinner? You know, you wasn't like you was being rebellious to God. You was just trying to have fun. And that church thing seemed like it was so restrictive. I mean, going to church and then they listening to that man talking. He was like, nah, that ain't for me. I want party. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> I mean, really. And it's funny because, you know, the devil has people thinking they can have more fun serving the devil. And if, if they knew how good this feels, how relieving it is, I mean, how liberating it is. I mean, you know, it's strange. You know, do you remember the first time you felt guilt-free? I mean, the first time you were like, I'm not worried about nothing. <laughs> like, I can relax. And that's what salvation affords me, the ability I mean, I can I can trust God. I don't have to worry about things. I don't have any uh any regrets, no condemnation. I'm not like looking over my shoulder. I mean, I'm not threatened. I'm not afraid. It's like you can like grow up conditioned in a way where you are watching out for this, look out for this. I don't know, sometimes your parents don't mean no harm, but they instill a lot of focus in it. And you really are like, even if you get, even if you start to do good, you're like, okay, all right, I gotta be careful because something else gonna happen. <laughs> don't get a big head because something, you know, you say, man, I just got a promotion. Okay, well, let me tell you something. Watch it because you know the devil is busy. Why are they always talking about the devil being busy? The Bible says the Lord neither sleeps nor slumbers. That's in the Bible. I don't see nothing in the Bible talking about the devil busy. And it gives you a sense of what you're worried about the devil. Like the, let me explain something to you. Do you know the devil is a creative being? The devil is an omniscient, omnipresent. He's not God. He got beat. He got knocked out of heaven. He lost. He down here messing with you. Because he tried to rebel against God and got his backside whooped. Okay? So why are we so worried about the devil? Matter of fact, God has such mastery of the devil that he even used what the devil is doing because the devil thinks he's doing something. He used what he does
to fulfill his, that's how, how far ahead God is than the devil. <laughs> I love how old folk you say, the devil can't do me no harm. That's true. He can do stuff, but he can't hurt me. He can't harm me. And so I'm not conscious of him. But it's a wonderful thing that when you can just be free. Now, I really believe, this is what I want to talk about today. I really believe that the problem comes in that grace is too good to be true. You know, I really believe that to have it this good does not make sense. There's a part of you that says, nah, 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 couldn't be this true. It couldn't be this good. It's like, as good as it feels initially, there's a part of you that says, I got to do more. You know, it is like, it couldn't be this easy. It, it couldn't be this effortless. It, 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 there, there must be something more I need to do. I mean, I can't be this blessed and I didn't earn it. I mean, I'm sure that God is requiring me to do something and do more. And I believe that's what, that's why I think it takes more faith to believe in grace because I believe grace goes against human nature. It goes against the typical way things are and the way they're set up. It doesn't make sense to the natural mind that you could get so much for so little. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. There's a part of you that feels like um, I, I need to be doing something. I, I need to be doing something. I mean, now it's all in your head. But grace is something that's hard for people to accept because they can't think it could be this painless, this smooth, this, this undemanding. You mean to tell me you mean to tell me I could have a clear conscience? You mean to tell me that I don't have to feel guilty about nothing? You mean to tell me I can have peace of mind? You know, you know it's weird. A lot of Christians are saved, but they don't live a saved life. They never, they, they're going to die, right? And when they get to heaven, they're going to be like, praise God. Woo! I finally have peace. And angel going to say, hey, 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 you can't have peace down there. No, I couldn't because it was the world and it was the devil and different things going on. It's like, nah, nah, you, you could have had peace. No, no, I couldn't because it was so hard. It was so much going on. It's not, that was all in your head. Why did Jesus say, you know, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? So don't tell me that you got to wait till the by and by or get to heaven. You know, you can have peace of mind now. Do you hear me? I, I need you to understand that you know, you don't have to have a worry in the world. Nothing. Be anxious for nothing. You see what, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I got this going on, that going on, and this going on. I remember one time I was going through a little stretch, man. I mean, th th everything was happening. I mean, <laughs> it just seemed like it was a lot of things. I'm going to tell you, so y'all pray for me. I said, you know. I'm teaching you, but I'm learning too. And, it's, and sometimes, you know, the human side of me, you know, it just gets the upper hand and I'm just feeling overwhelmed and frustrated and upset. And so I had nerve to try to be praying. And so I was like, Lord, you know, this is so much going on. Blah, blah, blah. And he asked me, what am I worried about? So what do you mean, what am I worried about? Oh, this stuff going on. I know you all know it. You've got to know this happened and that happened. 
He said, it ask me, so, but, but, but what I want to know is, what, what are you worried about? I said, I told you what I was worried about. I told you what I was worried and, 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 and he was like, well, that's your choice. You choose to be worried about that. You don't have to worry about that. I said, what do you mean? I have choice. I, I can't, I'm in this situation. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with it. He said, well, you know, technically, uh, you're saved. I mean, I have assumed control. I'm I'm looking over your life. You know, I, I'm, I'm taking care of everything. I can handle everything. I mean, all that you're doing is extra. All that you're doing is stuff you choose to do because you know, it ain't really making no difference but making yourself miserable. Because when Jesus died on the cross, you know he said it was finished. If he finished it, what are you doing? <laughs> Let me say something. When something is finished, it's done. You, you can't add nothing to it. It was like a relief. It was like truth. Truth came over me. I was like, oh, yeah. Whoa. And it's like, I do not have to worry. You know? I mean, some of you have pressure. There's a pressure on you. You've had this all your life. You live under pressure. You live with pressure. You feel pressure. You feel obligated. You feel like something has to be done. You're, 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 you're going to run out of time. You, you got to catch things before they get away from you. You got to keep people from doing things to you. You got to stay ahead of the game. You're always watching and caring, making sure. <laughs> Man, you got to hurry up and get off of morning manna because there's something else you got to get to. And today, watch these people because these people are trying to do and I'm going to stay ahead of them. Man, <laughs> that's what you call misery. Just a miserable existence when you got to think too much. And it really is a false reality because um, you ain't doing nothing. <laughs> you can't make anything happen. You can't make people do right. Stop wasting your time trying to do stuff you can't do. You know, you could be a lot more relaxed. I told you that time I went to Jamaica. And I was sitting out there by the pool, and the guy was saying, don't worry doo, 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 about a thing, doo, every little thing, doo, 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 it's going to be all right. I was like sitting, I said, oh, I said, man, I'm so glad I came here. I said, yeah, that's true, man, you know. And so the Lord said to me, you know, you can have that in buoy. <laughs> you know, you don't have to come all the way here to Jamaica to get a place where you don't have to worry. I mean, you got to cast all your cares. I'm going to chase a rabbit right now. Like, I need you to cast all your cares on the Lord. I need you right now to decide. You know, Pastor, they talking about me. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm the one. I'm carrying. I'm under pressure. Let me tell you something. You are saved. You are redeemed by the blood of Jesus you don't have to be worried about nothing. God has got you. I mean, he is your source. And, uh, you know, you can actually, it's sad for you to be saved and not feel good in yourself. I mean, that's something wrong. You're missing the whole point. You might as well stay a sinner if you're going to be like that. I mean, if you're gonna be if 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 you're gonna be walking around stressed out and upset and not feeling good, okay, you might as well stay in stay in uh, stay in darkness. The truth, the light, amen. It's like I'm not suggesting that you don't have pain. I'm not suggesting you don't have challenges. I'm not suggesting that everything's always perfect. I'm not suggesting to you that everything goes right for you and you never have any kind of challenges in your life. I'm not saying that. 
But what I am suggesting that you can always be relaxed. That God intends for you to be easygoing. I really believe that there's not anything, anything that I got to do right now. And I am riding, not driving. I'm going long and I'm not making and initiating. I'm trusting, I'm relying, I'm depending. Amen. <laughs> a lot of Christians do not believe it's possible to live an untroubled life. They really think all this drama and turmoil they feel inside is the nature of what it means to be a Christian. I mean, they it, it's funny because they come to the Lord and remain in a miserable world of wrestling within themselves and grappling with things that they have to come away. And I want to tell you something, ain't nothing but in their head. Ask you a personal question. I'm, I'm just going to ask you a personal question. How relaxed are you right now? I mean, how hard is your life? How, how comfortable? Comfortable life. How carefree are you? I mean, we say, but how mellow are you? <laughs> are you calm? I, I want to suggest to you that you should be unfazed, unconcerned. I mean, I think you shouldn't be overly conscious of your problems. It's difficult. That's a sign you ain't in the truth. Because the truth is that God promised that no weapon formed against you will prosper. He said, you know, if God be for me, he's more than the world against me. There's a mindfulness that should come with you being a Christian in the sense that you're uninhibited. I'm just wondering, how confident do you feel right now? You say, well, Pastor D, I really, see, Pastor D, Stuff's going on, this happened, and somebody did this, and da da. Look, nothing anybody does should face you. Because he's greater than all. And no man, you hear me? No man can pluck you from his hand. It's like them pigs. They told that well, you can huff and you can puff, but you can't blow this house down. <laughs> I mean, I would suggest that the problem may come from a place you would never look. The problem may be coming from your sincere heart. I mean, isn't it funny that your desire to do the right thing can be the very thing that gets you in trouble in the sense that you think that uh, you have to do more because this is too good to be true. That the mind cannot accept the fact that I actually can let God take care of everything and be at ease with everything. There's a difficulty in just receiving and accepting. I mean, has anyone ever tried to give you something and you said, nah, 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 I can't take that. I can't take that. You know, someone tried to, try to do something for you. They say, look, I'm going to pay for your meal. No, no, you can't. No, no, I'm not letting you pay for my meal. No, you're not going to pay for my meal. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, I can't, I can't take nothing I don't deserve. I can't take something from somebody and I don't deserve it. Yeah, and you think that's a good part of it, you think, you know. And so God, one time, he, he was talking to me, he said, you know, that, that your problem is you a little self-righteous. I said, I'm self-righteous? He said, yeah. He said, because when I try to bless you with something that you had nothing to do with, that's when you got a problem. That's when you like looking, nah, something got to be wrong with this picture. Because I didn't do anything to make that happen. I didn't have any role in that. You know? 
That's self-righteousness that thinks that is based on my performance, my action, my efforts. And it makes me turn down things that God could and would do for me. And it's like, God said, I be trying to do stuff for you. And here you go. Oh, no, no, God, I got it. You got what? <laughs> I can do it myself. Why were you trying to do something yourself when God wants to give it to you freely? I just tend to see, I'm talking about myself, but I want to make stuff happen. And I get really nervous when I can't do nothing. Do you find yourself sometimes in situations where you can't do nothing? I mean, the situation is out of your hands. You can't talk to the person. You can't buy, you don't have enough money. I mean, it's just like a situation where you say, oh man, oh man, what can I do? What can I do? And, and like when you go through your mind, you can't come up with that. In those situations, are you aware and conscious of the fact that you're not limited by what you can do. It's a matter of fact. It's a matter of fact. God intentionally is trying to teach you to let him do it. <laughs> Stop feeling bad when you're in a situation where it's out of your hands. Let me tell you, relationships, relationships are a good way to stay in the Lord. Because you cannot relate to certain people in your own strength because they are impossible. And that's the frustrating thing, you know, because you're like thinking, I need to talk to them. I need to do that. I need, and, and you do all that. And guess what? They don't, they don't talk to nothing. And you're like, oh, man. And I think so often we're praying for God to tell us what to do so we can do it. And we we feel like God didn't answer our prayer because we pray about it and he don't tell us to do nothing. Then we, we say, I'm seeking the Lord. I'm, I'm waiting for the Lord to tell. And the answer is, he ain't telling you nothing because you ain't doing it. <laughs> God is not counting on you. Can, can you believe for things that he's not going to use you to have to make it happen? Can you trust him with money you don't have yet? I mean, are you limited by God only coming one way? And that is through your factors, your youth. That's when you believe, yes, God, yes, we're going to do this. What about when he said, you ain't going to have nothing to do with it. I'm going to do it for you. Oh, no, no, God. Let me, let me be a part. Let me, let me have a part in. Let me, no, he said, no. I want you to just receive. And that's why I believe it takes a lot of faith. That's why I believe that it takes a lot of faith to believe by grace. And I think God is trying to get me to the place and get you to the place where you can live a, a better quality life. Where you can actually um, be free. I'm, I'm glad you're getting the mindset teaching. I mean, I'm really excited. I mean, you've got the thing, but you read your notes, man. You like getting the I'm starting to think appropriately what some things are honest and true. And I mean, I'm really getting that mindset teaching past me. Okay, when is this going to translate into your life being better? When is this going to translate into you having some joy? I mean, when are you going to stop being grumpy? <laughs> what about the people around you noticing that you're not yelling anymore? You're not frustrated anymore. You stop sighing. <sighs> I mean, we think of deliverance as the devil attacking us and, and we overcoming, but you know, I really believe deliverance is when you stop acting in a dysfunctional way. But you are delivered when you're free. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of times it's not the devil. It's not the evil that's out there. The problem 
is in you not operate in this truth, that it is by grace. You so intent on doing things in your own power and making things happen and trying to do things that what you don't realize is you got to operate in the truth. And the truth is, it's all by grace. You see, the difference between the spirit and the flesh is that the spirit is by grace and the flesh is by works. I'm talking to some of you because you are a do-gooder. Do you hear me? You are so sincere. You try so hard. I'm going to tell you something. You have a regiment. And you have your little prayer time. I mean, you do your little do. I mean, you got your discipline. I mean, you got all that together. And it's so funny because sometimes you get thrown off your regiment. You get thrown off your little plan of how you do. And then the enemy said, oh, you ain't going to be blessed now. Oh, you didn't have your prayer time. Oh, you were supposed to fast and you ate. Oh, man, you, know, you ain't going to be blessed now. <laughs> you know, so, you know well, 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 I, I had to get delivered because, you know, when I prepare my message, I have a regimen. I, have a, I spent hours and hours meditating, reading. I remember one time when we was building this church and I was just so busy. I had so much going on. And one Sunday, I just was so exhausted. I slept. I slept. I slept the night before. I woke up that morning and said, oh, no, I got to preach. And I thought about how I hadn't done my regular regiment, but I was just so tired. I was physically worn out, right? And so I was dreading going to preach. I never dread preaching. I love preaching. I love ministry. I mean, this gets me going. I'm excited. That day, I was scared. I was like, oh, man, this ain't going to be good. And then I said, so why not? Because I didn't do my prayer. I didn't do my thing. And I didn't study like I should. And he said, well, you were tired, weren't you? I know I was tired, but I can't get up there. And I'm not prepared. I haven't given, put in the work. I haven't done. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll tell you what. He said, I want you to just trust me, okay? I got you. I said, but Lord, how can I don't have anything in my mind? I don't have anything I've studied. There's nothing on this paper. I can't get up there like this. He said, go on up there, man. I got you. I was like, hold up. And you know, sure enough, I got up there and I had a couple words on a piece of paper, right? And so I just started preaching. And man, the Holy Ghost started speaking through me. And man, that was one of the best sermons I ever preached in my life, right? And afterwards, I was like, oh, God, that was so good. I said, he said, yeah, you know what the difference? I said, I said, what? He said, I did it this time. <laughs> he said, you know what? If you let me do stuff, it'll be a lot less do rest on you. I mean, how many things that you're doing that like God could do better? You know, God could do a better job with your family. See, when, you, when something is wearing you out, that's a sign. I'm going about this the wrong way. But let me tell you something. Children should not frustrate you, okay? And when you get frustrated, you're drawn from self and not the spirit. I mean, how can something that's supposed to be a blessing make you so miserable? Because you're not drawing upon God and you're not letting God do it. The turning point in ministry for me was when I realized I don't have to do this. I just let God do it. My main thing is to stay out of the way. I was at a funeral the other day and these other ministers were there, and I was in the back. And so I was sitting there talking, and, and they looked at me, and they said, you know, Mango, how is it you still look young? They said, you know, you look you look like you're not aging. They said, you know, you look like you're... And I was looking at them, and I was thinking, hmm, y'all definitely aging. 
I was sitting there thinking, the truth. Mm, yeah, y'all. Mm. I mean, a couple of them, they're a lot younger than me. They were a lot younger than me. I mean, you know, I've known them for years. Mm -hmm. They're a lot mm -hmm. younger than me. And I was like, dang. And, but you know, I was thinking about how a lot of it has to do with the fact that I don't have a lot of duress and stress because I'm learning. I ain't let these people get to me. I'm not going to operate on an unrealistic expectation. I ain't trying to do too much. And ultimately, I'm determined. I am going to have fun. Do you hear me? <laughs> I don't take myself too seriously. Pastor, that's to tell you. I spend most of my day laughing. I spend most of my day thinking of something that I can laugh about. And don't nobody make me laugh more than me. Because I know I'm a trip. <laughs> I do some of the most foolish things. Man, I mess up so bad sometimes. I just have to sit there and just give me a good. And I ask myself, what in the world are you doing? What's going on with you? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just don't think it should be all worked up and been out of shape. I mean, could I ask you a question? Could you not take yourself so seriously? Could you not feel so responsible? Could you not always be so tight? Today is a day when I'm going to relax. You hear me? Today is a day when I'm going to put stuff in the hands of the Lord. Make my people try to come in. You got to do something. Like, You're like, really? I got to do it. When I got to do it? Right now. I got to do it right now. Okay, good. Hey, Lord. Yeah, but then could you just take care of that phone? Could you do that? <laughs> you know, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Two things, labor and heavy laden. He said, come unto me. In, in other words, stop laboring and being heavy laden. You're not being a good Christian when you're laboring and heavy laden. I know you're not a good Christian when you sin, but that's not being a good Christian either. I know you so well, I'm trying to be sincere. I'm trying to do God's will. I'm trying to, yeah, but you're sincerely wrong because it's a bad testimony. And let's face it, who would want to, who would want to be a Christian if they're watching you? What's attractive about you know, coming to Christ, if I'm going to be like you, ain't much difference between you and me. You just go to church. When we say you let your light so shine, you know what we're talking about? We're talking about giving off a radiance where we make people wonder and desire what we have in us, that they would glorify our Father in heaven. I think when people see you and see you in real situations, see how you are, they, they, they wonder about you. They say, how in the world you didn't get married right then? How come you didn't curse them out? How come you always seem to be even killed? That's what makes a person say what church you go to. That's what makes a person want to know about your faith. I mean, the five spiritual laws and you try to preach to them and tell them, you know, they listen all that. Then they watch how you are. And the way you are should be a way that makes them want to know what's your secret. And I want to suggest to you, you can be just so sincere. But God wants the quality of your life to match the faith state, the faith mindset teaching. I want you to be mindful of the fact that it's by grace. And I'm just going to accept it. I'm just going to I'm going to let it happen. I'm going to stop doing I'm just going to just, I'm going to ride instead of drive. I'm going to sit back and let God do stuff. Everything that's bothering you, I want you to say, you know what, God, put that in your hand. And today is going to be one of the best days of my life. You know why? Because I'm going to put it all in God's hands. Father, I thank you today. I thank you because those Galatians are a lot like us. I mean, we 
we just think it's too good to be true. But God, you are trying to get us to let you have things. You want us to have peace. And well, you don't want us to worry or to doubt or be afraid. But God, help us to to not be so overly responsible and feel like we got to do this by a certain date. This has to be done. And, you know, I got to find this. I got to make my life straight. No, God, allow us to learn how to just receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning Manor out. <laughs>